to a, another news, the last one before Mr. Bottomley leaves us and just seeing me for the next four episodes. I don't know how well I'm going to do, but I I'm going to be neither. by myself. I'm a little nervous for you, Charles. I'll tune in to watch. <laughs> okay, that's good. <laughs> Episode number 10. We're coming at you. We're going to be bringing news. It's actually really good because we talk about not only the news outside of this, but then we also contrast what the actual news people are saying against what's actually happening, and that's why we call it the greatest news show in New York City across the world. <laughs> so um, I will start. This is from the Wall Street Journal. We're going a little bit different. Wow. I know. Finally. I know. We're going to the Wall Street Journal, and the reason being is I wanted to know what non-real estate in the know are actually saying, and one of the biggest and most popular ones is that the housing slowdown is wreaking havoc on short-term rentals. So the entire article was talking to four people that had incredible years, obviously, during 2020 to right now. A lot of investors actually bought short-term rentals. I have three friends that actually bought places in Lake Placid. Um, I think, uh, what's the, something George? I don't know, it's also in New York. And they have a whole system around it. They have an agent who rents it out, they have a cleaning service, and they are making five acts what their payments are. And what they were talking about and complaining about during the entire time was they're just not making the income. I don't think they'll ever get to that point again that that many people are looking for short-term rentals outside of the city and get the money and the demand. They, they said they had almost 100% occupancy since April 2020. Wow all across Texas, all across Florida, all across Utah, all across Arizona were the four states that they actually centered upon. What's, what's your thoughts on the slowdown? Well, I, I thought you just said that they were making five times their payments. Yeah. So then, isn't that a good thing? It slowed down. Yeah. It slowed down. That's no surprise. I haven't actually talked to my friends who, and it's funny too, because they had this whole system, and then the fees, I know the fees have gone up, so that is the Airbnb fees, the yep. uh, VRBO fees have gone up. So it cuts into the profits. Obviously, taxes go up. I don't know about the mortgage rates. And then it's this thing that was glorious. We were talking about before is all these people were positive when it was amazing. And now that... Totally. I feel terrible for those people, honestly, because I don't they see were living ever, in delusion. ever getting back to that. They were uh, living in delusion. You know, in reality, if you're going to a hot vacation, if you've planned a vacation and you're going to go there, I mean, unless it's going to be for a very extended amount of time, wouldn't you... Case in point. Like, three months? Yeah. I mean, because, like, wouldn't you just stay at a hotel? Yeah. Full service? Have the cleaning person yep. come in every single day. Yep. Have a concierge downstairs. Have room service. Have everything you have right outside. The hotels have the best locations. Yep. You know, it's like a no-brainer. I've stayed at an Airbnb maybe twice, and both times were very disappointed. Yeah. The, if well, the, you go and you split it with a bunch of people, yeah, one, then exactly. that could be nice, and yeah. you know, you want something different. But uh, yeah, large groups. And think families. about the wear and tear on those as well. Yeah. Just to add some more pain to the Airbnb. Oh, yeah. Well, one of them was talking about it was like a $5,000 <laughs> that they had to spend because it was, you, cause you don't know who you're renting it to. And yeah. They're obviously going there to party. Yeah. You know, I, the last Airbnb I went to is for a bachelor party. <laughs> well, it's funny that you said that stay in a hotel is that I had someone who was looking to do six months in New York City. And I said, well, she wants to be right along the park. And there's nothing along the park that she can do short term. First of all, short term in the city is non-existent. And then along the park, it's just co-ops that would never allow short term. And I said, what about hotels? We actually priced it out and it makes more sense. Yeah. Do the hotel. Yeah. You and know? if you call them up, you can probably get a better deal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I would say that even sometimes with the hot rental market, you could look and find a hotel where it's better than renting on a monthly basis. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's funny. The, the only time that I actually use Airbnb is for my triathlons because they're in the middle of nowhere. If it's in a major city, that's different. But this is in like Columbus and there's one hotel and it's always booked because there's like 5,000 people that are going to that one city 
in one weekend, and I'm like, I can't find you anything. You get off a long flight, you've traveled, you have all of your luggage, you <laughs> get there, and then all of a sudden, instead of walking into a nice hotel where they greet you, where, you know, they're it's all happy. happened in happy. Florida. You walk in and you have to go meet some owner who's going to give you the keys, yeah. to give you all the rules. I had it where Sounds the owner terrible. was in the house. Oh, and then you're figuring out the remotes. <laughs> like, you know, yeah, exactly. You know, this is actually just a room. We, yeah, we went to Homestead, <laughs> and the owner, we walked in, and we're like, there's someone in this house. And it, the owner said, oh, by the way, did you not read the email follow-up? And I was like, I already booked it. I'm staying in this house with the owner, and, and my mom was there with me. And I'm like, this is, this is ridiculous. Well, final thought on this. I saw a chart. It had the stock chart of Marriott. And then below it was the stock chart of Airbnb. <laughs> <laughs> and let's just say Marriott is it's doing very, very well. Yeah. So uh, I've got two articles here. And one, the headlines sound, you know, one is really, really Click negative. Baby. Okay. The other one is really positive. Okay. And then the Would, actual content of the article is the, the opposite, opposite <laughs> which I thought it was really funny. So I don't know which one you want to start out with. But I think this one is better. In The Gothamist, great article. Is New York facing a doom loop scenario? A discussion has started. So they... they <laughs> <laughs> a discussion has started. A discussion has started. We saw two well, people doing the news. Well, that's the, the good <laughs> thing about, about this article is because they're not actually writing it. They're just yeah. talking about the discussion that's yeah. already <laughs> going on. So it was a lot of quotes, and that's kind of where... Journalism. The, do the doom loop scenario. What does that even mean? Yeah. It is like this uh, never-ending cycle of there's less people coming into the city, less people going into the office, yep. less money that the uh, uh, city can get from revenue, from taxes, uh, the red stabilization problem. All of these things are these compounding problems that's actually just a downward spiral where it's making it tougher and tougher to get out. Uh, to make the city a place that, like, to do all the things that you want to do to make it uh, the best, yeah. to make it the place where everybody wants to live, to make it the place where the high taxpayers are going to want to stay. Yeah. Because there is no doubt about it, since 2020, many of the high-income earners have moved to tax havens. And why yeah. did they do that? To save some money. Why would you want to come back to New York City as your primary residence when you're going to have the highest tax rate? Yeah. And so you can... As a primary resident. Yeah. yeah. So then you can help the city to become, you know... So the problem is the downward spiral. What would that be? They're probably going to then tax second homes. Yeah. <laughs> which will then make people not want to have second homes. Yeah. <laughs> which will then go back to that <laughs> hotel thing, which is this downward spiral. But many, much of the article was uh, people from the city advocating for why the city like can get through this doom loop scenario and that yeah. it's not going to happen. So that's why the article There's really no city like the city though. That's yeah. the thing. In Very the United true. States, maybe globally, that like New York City is so diverse when it comes to everything. You know, it's not known for one thing. It used to be known for financial, now it's known for everything. Between theater, you have you have sightseeing, you have great restaurants, you have parks. Uh, you have the old, you have the new, you know, a lot of cities, and it's just contained. It's not just all over the place like a lot of other cities. Like L.A. County is a gigantic place. You know, Miami is known for one item, which is beaches, and then you have nightclubs and things like that. New York City, you can come here for a lot of things. You know, so I, I don't think it's going to go downward to the point where no one's going to move here. I think it's going to be a shifting. I think it will shift. I don't think the the high end um, developments will happen as much. You know, those have stopped a little bit. It's a great place to develop, though. Well, and at the same time, though, I mean, I'm not trying to rip on the city, but they had it so well. You know, they had it the gravy train, and it was for years and years and years yeah. and years. And you know, not to be rude, but where did all the money go? Yeah. You know, they they were you never. Never spend the money wisely. Yeah. And they are not running a surplus. Yeah. You well, <laughs> talking about money. Right. We have, um, so this one is actually, I was going through the articles and the consistent basis that I saw on the West Coast, very interesting, were agents moving to different companies. So I think during this last two years, like 
it was 12 articles and eight of them were about big agents moving between companies. So it's very interesting that during the last two years, when it was the best time to be a real estate agent outside of New York City, uh, New York City was pretty good too, but outside of the city, all of these agents, I think they discovered that their company may not be on the cutting edge or another company exists or that their brand needs to be refreshed. And these are major, major agents moving between a lot of them on the West Coast, um, you know, between California, Texas, uh, Washington, and it'll be interesting going forward what happens because there's a lot of, you know, Compass is one of them. You know, Compass is now public. You know the financials, obviously, uh, the others as well. You know, Element, you know what their financials are as well. So it'll be interesting the dynamic, what you see between what you give the agent from the brokerage and what the agent needs to do themselves. You know, like, is there a desk fee? I know a lot of people outside of the industry don't understand, but there's a desk fee sometimes. You have to pay for your marketing expenses, and, and then you also have to cut the money with the company. So it's like, it's going to be an interesting dynamic, say, the next five years, where it's not a gravy train, as you just said. You know, what, what happens with the agents and the brokerage? Do they go out on their own? Do they go to different companies? What are your, what are your thoughts on agents going to other companies and... Would, would, do you, you think know, they're going to stay? I would stay? say that because being a broker is not an easy job, uh, being a sales agent is not an easy job. So why were they going around in the best time ever? Because they probably were unhappy with what was going on. The services and, provided, the leadership, management. Well, I mean, and also like the leads. Yeah. You know, like it always is about the leads because there's one thing that separates the agents from all the other agents is there is one agent who can sell the home. Yeah. And you know, that's what the people want. Yeah. The customer wants the agent who can sell the home. So, you know, the agent finds their place, so their brokerage, the one who can maximize the way that they can do that. Yep. And then there's so many agents out there, I'd say they yeah. just hop around. Uh, just to think of one quick one is that Element just like splurged on Frederickstein. Oh know? wow! They Good. went all in. Yeah. You know? And he signed There's up. I think it was for a lifetime. Wow. So wow. you know he's not going anywhere though. Exactly. Yeah. So that's where it's like when somebody has a very established business and knows they're treated well, why wouldn't they? You know. It's like Ryan it leaving Nest Seekers. Yeah. You know. I'd say that was a little more because like they weren't able to offer him what he. Well, that's what I'm saying. Was able now to. you don't yeah. hear them as much. Oh yeah. You know, it's it's interesting, and and this is the last thing I'll say with it is that with the presence of social media, the game has totally changed now. You know, there's agents that are now solely doing and going all in on YouTube, or solely going in on TikTok, and they're getting huge amount of leads there. That's not coming from the brokerage. Like, what is the brokerage? What's the value? This is the question that brokerages are now going to have to say is, what is the value I now provide someone that's already doing their own TikToks or their own Instagram or YouTube videos and getting all the leads that they need, you know? Yeah. Or they're throwing their own client parties and following up with them. Like, what is the value the brokerage uh, provides the agent? So that that's, yeah, that's the next five point. years. Yeah, because the last thing is the agents pretty much run their own business. Yeah. So they're adding value to the brokerage's business. Yeah. You know, the last five years are very interesting to dictate the next five. Yeah. So the next article, real estate markets set to normalize in 2023 after nearly three years of pandemic boom. So that sounds pretty positive, right? <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Sounded pretty positive. Mansion Global. <laughs> So I thought that was going okay. to be uh, full of positivity, but really it just started going into, you know, blah, how blah, we blah. went off on a huge boom and yeah. talked all about the, the gravy train, the yeah. high sales volume and how it's totally fallen off. And even the secondary part of this headline, sales volume has already started slowing and turnaround is not capital, not Whoa. expected until the second half of next year. Next I mean, year or this year? Twenty twenty four was twenty twenty three. Okay. So, so this 2024. was written on, on January one. So I'd during say, an election. Yeah. Oh, yeah. see, that's yeah. You know, and still worthy article to read. I'd say both of these, the Gothamist and the Mansion Global, because you know this is the type of perspective. This is what the customers are reading. This yeah. is what the buyers are reading. This is what the sellers are reading. Yeah. So. 
You yeah. know, you really have to just like figure it out on your own. It's a personal decision. And it's it's interesting is that people will take an article like this and say no one's doing anything. Meanwhile, I just got off the phone with someone who can't find a home in New Jersey where they're living because there is no inventory. Right. So it's like there's people individually who are still going to buy and sell. I remember 2020 when we were all walking around with masks showing apartments and I'm just thinking like who's buying in this environment? But people see either an opportunity or something happens in their life. They get married, they have kids, they want to downsize, they want to upsize. Exactly the people right. are still going to be buying and selling. Choosing the right agent is yeah, everything. No, and that they got to be positive. Uh, that's exactly right. See the value of the home. It's all about the, what the customer needs to do. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of reasons why you buy and sell real estate. So the noise is just the news that's coming around it. Yeah. The news about the market. And I would have to say that as like eternal optimists, it is good to read these articles this is what the people are reading. Have a positive yeah. perspective. Yeah. You know, if you're going to go around in the real estate business with a negative attitude, I mean, then, then these type you're of done. articles are going to. Those are the people you don't hire on the buy side or the sell side because they're the ones negotiating your home. Yeah. And if they are not positive or they don't see the value in your home, it's impossible to get the right person. You know, I, I would say. 2023, honestly, I think it's going to be a stabilization year. I don't see it going down a lot or much. I don't see it going up. I think it's just going to be just a normalized market because we're comparing it to the last two and a half years, which has been 60 people outside of an open house in Raleigh, North Carolina, buying one house because there's no inventory. You can't compare that. That's not normal. Just like right now, you know, like how many days on the market? It's gone up a little bit, but it's still a good time to sell because it's under the average. Okay, the average is six months. Right now, it's probably about three months of inventory. So we'll be back, or I'll be back in a week. Yeah. Uh, he's going to be getting some sun down under in uh, New Zealand. He's already he's already on the plane right now. He's walking away. Yeah. But yeah, I'll uh, see you next year. <laughs> <laughs> next, next month. month. All right. All right, guys. Well, enjoy, and we will talk.